Some might think that Overlord is just a dumb, OP main character, isekai harem type garbage with little to no depth and pedestrian plot. If you do, you made some spelling mistakes in the word conception. Ainsama's story is by no means simple. Yeah, sure, he gets teleported to another world with some waifus and broken abilities, but there are plenty of nuances that you might have uh, overlooked. Hello, comrade. My name is Mahis. Come, get yourself a beverage and sit down with me. We got season 1 to look into. I've already made a video about some Overlord details, however, it did not fit everything I wanted to talk about. On top of that, I was more or less bound by a spoiler warning, so this time we go at it with major plot points, light novel stuff, etc. You've been warned is all I'm saying. If there is one misconception that a lot of dudes are guilty of, is that Yggdrasil is a good and exciting game. Uh, it must be, right? We've got previously unheard of freedom in every possible aspect except for the most important one, classes upon classes to build your character around, and the character itself can be pretty much anything. It's a dream for many RPG fans, and I can totally see why people are drooling over it. However, did you forget how many times Ainsama used the cash shop item to change the title battle? He did it several times with Shaltir, saved Gazov, gave them to Enri, he doesn't shy away from using them in the situation where he didn't need them in the first place. Just like many Asian MMORPGs, Yggdrasil is a shameless gacha, and the fact that it's lasted for so many years means that there's either hasn't been any competition, which is kinda possible given how fucked up shit got by the year 2138, or all of the gacha bullshit was not enough to overshadow the positives of the game. An attentive listener will say that I'm contradicting myself, and will be somewhat right. The reason for that is perspective. Western gaming world is drastically different from the Eastern. Remember Diablo Immoral? How the community was outraged, how websites refused to make guides for it, and entire countries banning the game? Well, hate to break it to you, financially it was a huge success and its ROI is astronomical. Who cares that it will be forgotten in a year or so, the monies have been made and a new project is already in production. That's how Asian game industry is, and has been for a while. People actually wail their entire salaries to get an edge over others in a game that will disappear before the next Christmas. And the worst part, it's coming to us, because that shit works. Damn gamers, they ruined our games! I bet you my last bag of tea, Momonga was opening those loot boxes like no tomorrow. As much as we see skill being a decisive factor, proper preparations, deception and optimal ability usage, but when there are items that literally help you bypass core game mechanics like cast time, pay to win is an understatement, to say the least. On the topic of unfair advantage and something being a considerable threat to Nazarek, we got to address Inferior. This kid for sure is talented when it comes to alchemy and scoring so damn well that he ends up regretting it at times, as well as having an actual, tangible talent called magic item affinity. A quick word about talents. In the new world, this is a quirk so to speak, something you are born with and it cannot be changed, which means that if you are a small brain and somehow got a magic related talent, uh, too bad. However, most of the time they are more useful than not and are highly regarded by people around them. Prime examples are, of course, Enfi and his wrinkly old ass, whose talent can see the size of your magic cock. Very useful to evaluate an opponent and so on, but does not give you an advantage over someone in battle or everyday life. Mr. Banks, on the other hand, has a very scary ability. You see, when I say magic item affinity, I mean all magic items. And unfortunately for Ainsama, Staff of Ein Sol Gong counts as one of them, along with many other things locked away in the mausoleum. I don't think we are talking about world items here, as it looks like they can be used by anyone more or less. Still, I don't need to elaborate on how dangerous the situation might be if inferior to acquire a high level item. Although, I don't see him willingly go against the Bone Daddy because of our dude saving Henry and his own life a few times, plus his admiration as a magic user, and in general, he's not that dumb. What can happen though is exactly what we've seen, somebody taking control and doing something potentially harmful to Nazarek. Forget this kindergarten nonsense and a few low level undead. If slain theocracy had all cards in hand, like information on inferior talent and were a bit more cautious, Shaltir could have been a much bigger problem. Moving on to something less thrilling, to the time when Momon had a little altercation with the innkeeper. That whole scene never made sense to me, and hear me out on this one. A fully geared dude with a beautiful woman in tow rolls up to this shitty place. They ask for a room and the guy at the counter is like, for you sir specifically, 7 copper instead of 5 because you are a newbie copper plate. The fuck? 
Okay, even if we don't consider the fact that this is a 7 foot tall absolute unit of a man, you mean to tell me that his visibly well off ass cares about 2 copper coins? I'd understand if we are in a game and this is a starting zone in which you're supposed to be some chicken chaser from the nearest village, but this is a real world where people have some degree of intelligence. Well, the situation is just poorly explained in the anime, and you can figure it out if you pay attention. In the novel, when Momon arrived, the innkeeper asked how long are you staying, and after being told one night, he replied with five copper. Then Play Daddy inquired about a double room and the guy didn't like it, asking if the adventurers knew why they were sent here of all places. The following negative response got him even more riled up, and he berated them for a bit about ranks and how to do this adventuring thing, but when faced with a calm reaction, agreed to rent a double room for seven copper. As you can see, in this context, it's Momon's ignorance about how the system works that got him so angry. The innkeeper was legit concerned that the noobs won't be able to form a party if they stay in a separate room, risking their lives in the field. Damn, what a nice dude, all things considered. Speaking of all things considered, I once again want to talk about the brilliance of Ein Sama. It's funny, when people try to convince me that Muzan is actually smart and is doing things right, I get excited and look into whatever is being pitched to me, only to find that this man is as dumb as a brick and even Patrick, god forbid, star makes more fucking sense. Seriously, the more I look into it, the more convinced I become of his idiocy, and it's the same with Ein Sama, except it's the opposite. The more I try to understand why people call him stupid, the more intelligent he appears. Check this out, he got transported to this world and has no idea what the hell is going on here. Then some people give him a rundown of major events, a geography lesson, a general overview of the situation. Next thing you know, he was able to deduce that slain theocracy is pouring oil on the fire of conflict between Bakhrut and Riestis. Then, after speaking to Gazev, he concluded that these new forces are after him and that he is quite despised for whatever reason. Bone Daddy didn't need his advisors or even some time to think on the matter, he just... You know what? I've talked about it previously. He is actually smart, so let's get to the last part of the video. Feelings. Yep, that thumbnail wasn't a clickbait. During the events of Shaltir's Rebellion, we get a very touchy dialogue between Alberto and Ein Sama, where he mentioned that he saved himself a spot in the mausoleum, implying that he might leave too, which obviously upset and shook Alberto to the core, as it would mean that the last of the supreme beings is planning to go. Yeah, pretty sad, but come on, they've only been here for how many days? A week max? No way the ex-NPCs were able to build up so much grief in such a short period of time. Here is when I recall the conversation between Shaltir and Sebas, the one about Boku Boku Chagama voicing a character for an adult game. At first glance, it's nothing short of comedic relief and giving us some insight on the great ones. However, this one thing didn't click with me until much later. Everybody in Nazarick remembers Yggdrasil and everything that happened within the tomb. Shit. How many years did it last? Look at the situation from Albedo's point of view. For years she has been witnessing the Great Ones disappearing. First it was others, then it was her own creator, and ultimately there was almost nobody left. Remember when Momonga took the mates for a stroll, he had to remind himself about them and how to issue a command, which means that he hasn't done that in a while. Our lovely succubus and the entire squad have been hella lonely, staying on their floors, patrolling and diligently following orders bestowed upon them by their… parents who then left. And then, all of a sudden, they get so much attention from the leader of the supreme beings, they pledge their loyalty, they go and do stuff together out in the world, no longer limited by Nazarick. No fucking shit Alberto is distressed just by a mere thought of losing her precious darling and that she'll do anything and everything to prevent that. She went as far as to create an elite squad to hunt down players to make sure that Ein Sama will never reunite with them and get a reason to depart. Truly, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Call her Yandere all you want, but this over here hit me right in the feels, especially after realizing what she has been through. So yeah, Overlord is not just about a guy with a bunch of waifus. This show has so much going on on the storytelling and emotional level that it doesn't matter what's going on on the screen, be it comedy, a grand political drama, or a story about a local team of adventurers who made their end in darkness, all you need to do is pay just a bit more attention and you'll be rewarded. It was I, Machius, tearing up into the microphone. Have a great uh, whatever time of the day you have. Until next time, cheers.